I work at SIA, the International Center for Tropical Agriculture, where I direct a group that does soils research. And today I'm going to speak mostly about this, our work in landscapes. SIAT is one of the oldest centers and it has other areas of work that include breeding, technology development, and value chain approaches, um, all associated with, with those programs. So I just wanted to put in a little mention of that and the fact that we've just launched a new strategy for SIAT, which is available on the website if you're interested in the broader range of what SIAT um, does. Uh, I'm going to speak about an area of work that we do that's maybe less known uh, outside of um, our closer friends. Uh, and that is uh, the landscape work, work that we do. So um, as, you, as you mentioned, this whole landscape approach is really gaining a lot of ground. You see it emerging all over the place. Uh, and one of the, the good examples of that was at the, um, uh, the Global Landscape Forum at the UNFCCC COP in Warsaw last year. That's where the Ag Day and the Forest Day came together to, to create a landscape forum. Uh, and launched it there at the COP. This was um, supported by the World Bank strongly, and they've also launched a website and, and, and programs on landscape called Landscape Approaches in Sustainable Development. Uh, then we also have some initiatives that have been working much longer in this area of landscape. For example, the Landscape for People, Food, and Nature, led by the EcoAg Partners and, and, um, and that, their partnership. Um, and they've recently done uh, gone beyond just describing landscapes and done a global and regional reviews of landscape uh, programs and projects where they've um, sort of cat uh, cataloged integrated landscape initiatives and found that there are actually hundreds already on the ground. A really nice resource. Uh, the CGIR is also catching up quite strongly with the launch of a new program, Water, Land, and Ecosystems, where the scale that's taken is landscapes and larger. Uh, and as you mentioned, this... Um, and uh, last but not least is that, that your platform itself has, uh, at the General Assembly just now in Paris, uh, was looking at territorial approaches in the changing rural environment. So that's the context within which, you know, landscapes is now. It's no longer a, what are you talking about? It's more let's get on with it kind of, kind of environment, I think. So first, I, I have to, to digress for a minute and say, okay, but what really is a landscape? I'm asked this a lot. A landscape can be the smallholder farming landscape and sloping lands, this is sort of the classic view that we think of when we talk about landscape. But a landscape can also be an urban landscape uh, with very little trees involved. A landscape can be a pastoral landscape, much more extensive land use uh, with degraded lands and, and a lot of animals. But a landscape can also be a natural landscape. And I think one of the most important things I want to say about landscape is that all of these are formed by the initiative of peoples. People, these are coupled human ecological systems where people and the environment have interacted over time to create what it is that we have now. Even the giraffe in the Maasai Mara National Park, we now know that this landscape, its biodiversity, its ecosystem niches were created by 2,000 years of human habitation and activity. And that now that people have been excluded from the park, it's actually an unnatural landscape. And we also, I think one of the important things about landscapes is it helps us to embrace the complexity that leads us to understanding that um, we're living in a global landscape now that's much more interconnected than it used to be. I want to mention a couple of strong features of current changing rural environments uh, to do with landscapes. One of them is the really rapid change that we're seeing uh, in landscapes, especially in developing countries. And this is driven by very large uh, scale investment. What I'm talking about here is things like rubber plantations in Laos or the hundreds of dams that are being built on the Mekong, uh, which change the environment entirely. There's also tens of thousands of hectares of new land coming under production in, for example, the plains of Colombia, the breadbasket of Colombia. And in addition, in Africa, there's massive change. Uh, large-scale, large investment in, for example, growth corridors, uh, which, is, which are going to uh, increase production a lot. And also, the expansion of irrigation is a very large feature uh, in African landscapes. Uh, a recent study actually showed that farmers themselves in implementing small-scale irrigation are actually affecting hundreds of thousands of hectares of land in countries like Burkina Faso uh, and Tanzania. The, the big question here is, how is that investment going to play out 
I think that the story is no longer, we need more investment, we need more investment. There is a lot of investment happening. So how can we ensure the future of that investment? How is it to be made sustainable and socially inclusive? And I think that's the role that research can play in, in the current landscape. Another feature that's, that's emerging really strongly is this dominance of globalization, income, and international trade as major drivers of land use change. Uh, we're very familiar with the concepts oh, that population growth is changing land use um, uh, or, or urbanization is changing land use. But in fact, these, this globalization phenomenon and the increase in incomes which is changing people's diets and spending patterns is actually overtaking population as uh, a controller of how land use is being made and how landscapes are being transformed. One um, example here from soy, the soy trade, is you can see that most of the soy comes from the U.S. and from Brazil, uh, but depending where it's going, mostly going to feed animals in Europe and China, depending where it's going actually affects the land use practices on single farms. So, for example, the, the European policy to, to um, exclude uh, GMO crops has actually uh, translated into a certification program in Brazil, and many, many farmers sign up to be certified non-GMO and also buy into then a practice of sustainable land use practices. So this has major implications for how we see governance of these landscapes. It doesn't necessarily have to be the local government that's controlling what's actually happening on the ground. So we get to the question then of why landscape? I think this is something you've discussed quite um, thoroughly in the platform already. Agriculture, water, forest, food security, they're all connected. Uh, and the landscapes combine all of these geographically and the socioeconomic approaches and interactions among these different sectors in, in place. At the landscape scale, governance, ownership, and ecology are all integrated. And I think most importantly, in landscapes, we can actually achieve the multiple goals that we want to achieve. We have multiple goals now for all our, our landscapes. We want to sustain communities. We want to produce goods. We want to store carbon. We want to protect wildlife. We want biodiversity and ecosystem services to be maintained. So that's the real rationale for why, why the landscapes in the first place. What I want to do now is describe a little bit of what SEAT's work in landscapes um, looks like, uh, the kind of entry points that we use. Uh, and I've picked a couple of ways, to, a couple of categories for this. One of them is really to do with managing the water, food, and energy nexus in upper catchments. And another, is uh, completely different transformation processes where we're trying to ensure sustainability and social inclusion during this transition from low intensity agriculture to this larger scale farming which is happening in a lot of our, in a lot of our regions. Uh, SEAT, because uh, we lead the Climate Change Agriculture and Food Security Program of the CGIR, we also incorporate climate change uh, resilience and adaptation throughout as a cost-cutting issue. The first example is from Kenya here in the upper Tana Basin. Um, we have a classic situation, a classic problem set. The uplands are degraded. There's a lot of erosion and sedimentation. Food insecurity is very high. Uh, poverty is very high, 40 to 50 percent poverty rates. Downstream from this area, there's hydropower development that produces 70 percent of Kenya's hydropower. The water supplies, uh, uh, supplies Nairobi's water 90 percent of, it, of its water. The big question is, on what basis can investments be made that would benefit the upstream and the downstream users in this situation? Uh, and in this situation, SEAT is working to supply the evidence that's needed to um, activate payment for ecosystem services schemes. This scheme is, is uh, working under the Nature Conservancy's Water Fund. It's a public-private partnership. And if it's activated, it will become the first in Africa to actually um, create an active payment for environmental scheme. Here, what we do is basically quantifying and valuing ecosystem services, but I'll give you a better picture of what that sort of means. One thing it means is that we look at land use dynamics. Um, we can look at this at very fine scales now, and we can understand how much land use here in this basin, half the land use in a decade is changing from one thing to another. The dynamics is part of the story and part of what we have to work with when we're designing um, intervention schemes. The next, um, the next thing that we do is take a landscape approach to our services that we're interested in, in this example, sedimentation. 
you can't look at only sedimentation off the agricultural fields or under forests or plantations, but also you have to include what's happening on, from roads, um, uh, rivers, and, and other areas of the, the, of the landscape that are actually contributing sediments. We also look at the climate change futures here. We look at what, how the crop suitability is going to change and how that might uh, affect what people plant and where they plant it and how. We combine this, all of this information into plausible scenarios that then can be used by the, the water fund to develop an understanding first of the trade-offs that would be inherent in any particular management interventions and also the location of interventions and where they can get the most, uh, the most benefit for their investment. There's another example that's much more mature that's got a very similar problem set and similar types of research science behind it where we have now been able to achieve really significant outcomes. We're really, we're really excited about this. This is based on, on the work of Seattle and Partners. You see this Compandis uh, project. Um, the Ministry of Environment in Peru has established a new scheme for rewarding ecosystem services in the Cañete River Basin. They've designated the basin as an official pilot for national benefit sharing program. If this is successful, the pilot will be scaled up and implemented in another 53 river basins. In addition, the ministry is being, developing an ecosystem services law aimed to foster more benefit sharing, and it's scheduled to be ratified this year. So we're really pleased that in this case, the, the research uh, support that we've provided has actually contributed to um, creating financial education and health benefits now flowing to those who are caring for the environment upstream in this basin. Turning to the other kind of landscapes that I wanted to, to, to talk about, these are the ones where we have large internal and external investment, public, private investment, governments, food, uh, the food industry. Uh, they're looking at commercial agriculture, sometimes mining, hydropower investment. These, these investments are going to create massive environmental change. Our question is, will this development be sustainable, and green, with benefits equitable to the local population? One example where we work in Colombia in partnership with the, the government uh, and Coporica, it's the National Research Agency, CIAT monitors options to improve, uh, monitors different options uh, and gives advice and recommendations on how to improve the overall uh, outcome of the ecosystem services within the framework of the investments occurring. Another example where we're just beginning to work is in the, the Southern Agriculture Growth Corridor of Tanzania, the SACWAP. Here, there's a um, green reference group started. CF's going to be a research um, partner in that reference group that's going to help with research evidence to manage equity and maintain soil health, ecosystem services, and try to make the investments more climate resilient. So, with those examples, what I wanted to describe is, well, what is, and I often get asked, what, what is it that you're doing different because it's landscapes or because it's integrated? So this is just a summary, my own summary of what it is that SEAT does that's really different because we're taking the landscape approach. The first and most important, I think, is the institutions and the partnerships. When you, um, we've moved uh, far from the days of farmer field schools where you teach one farmer, a model farmer, to teach other farmers to to outscale one particular technology, and even beyond the next stage, which has been uh, value chains where you, you get an innovation platform together and get all the people involved in the different uh, economic activities related to a value chain together to work together. And now in, with the landscape approach, we look at multiple sectors that have to be engaged uh, in the partnerships. The other big difference is that we, we uh, try to engage with partnerships before we start the research work to ensure that what we're doing is demand-driven and will be found useful later on. In terms of the research, we use integrating frameworks. We use, for example, ecosystem services frameworks so that you can negotiate trade-offs amongst the different uses and users of the environment, and you'll understand what you're actually uh, negotiating over. In terms of uh, uh, the research also, the scale is different and big data have changed, uh, changed a lot what we can do. The models are more sophisticated, the, the spatial resolution is better, and there's also a lot of really exciting new things in gaming that's helping people to bring participatory approaches into our big data um, environments. This has a lot of impact also on abilities to measure and monitor change, which is a, is a major challenge when you're working in landscapes. <clears throat> Another thing that's different is that we look a lot more at 
transitions, trajectories, and pathways. So, for example, you know, the course of change and how does that affect where, where you come from and how does that affect where you might be going to. And that also helps you anticipate uh, climate change impacts. To sum up, I have just a couple of slides. Um, one is challenges, and this is really challenges for you. What, what is the challenge to a donor platform, I would say, about landscapes? Uh, <clears throat> investing in landscapes, that's the challenge at hand, I think. Part of the problem is there's multiple definitions. There are many different ways to, to define a landscape, and so people don't always know what we're talking about. I personally like the fuzzy definition of landscapes because what it allows us to do is get away from really um, rigid definitions, say like a watershed, which has to be defined by biophysical boundaries, and allows you to draw your landscape uh, boundaries around political boundaries or managerial boundaries, decision-making spaces, while still being grounded into geography. My favorite actually is the Kailash Sacred Landscape where three countries, Nepal, India, and China, are managing that landscape together. And what, draw, what makes it a landscape is that all of the pilgrimage routes from the different countries leading to the sacred landscape is, is the boundaries of this landscape. I love that one. The other thing that's um, a big challenge is investing in, enough in the enabling institutions, the enabling environment, because there's a lot of um, supporting dialogue and institutional uh, backstopping that has to occur before you get change in a landscape situation. There's also longer term requirements for investment. It's more difficult for you to set goals and to monitor progress. I think that's where research could, should really be able to help you. <laughs> and it requires that you embrace the variability in the landscape. It's not just one field, one that's alike everywhere. There's all of the variability in different sectors that have to be dealt with and you have to manage that complexity. There's a lot more sophisticated uh, view on this just launched by the Landscape for People, Food, and Nature initiatives on the website talking about financing landscapes. And we had a very exciting uh, dialogue on that at the, at the COP uh, last year. If you do accept the challenges and want to try to do something in landscapes, I think there's tremendous opportunities. This is where opportunities lie to create sustainable futures in rural development. Uh, one, I think that's very exciting, is to be able to support these sort of nascent sustainability agendas, agendas in developing countries and their sustainable development goals. A very good example of this in Ethiopia, I went just a few weeks ago to visit the Ministry of Environment. The Ministry of Environment and Forestry in Ethiopia is only eight months old. It was a department underneath uh, within the Ag Ministry, and they've just elevated it to a ministry on its own because they've passed a, a green growth policy, and this, this uh, ministry is tasked to implement that green growth policy for Ethiopia. This is a tremendous change for this country and uh, uh, will be a tremendous way to support um, their sustainability agenda through that ministry. The other thing that, that uh, investment can do is also to ensure that development, investment, and planning and implementation will benefit from the new tools and the data to, the, to be integrated using ecosystem services frameworks or to be evidence-based, that's something that, that can help uh, realize these opportunities. And the other one that's kind of interesting, I think, is to embrace these remote drivers in landscapes uh, and opportunities for remote governance. We can look at, at off-site, uh, we're calling them now sometimes telecoupled landscapes, to influence uh, in one place, you might, you might actually have part of your program or project in another. That, that can change things on the ground. So with that, um, I thank you very much for your attention and for the opportunity to speak, and I'm very happy to be able to discuss and answer any questions that you might have. Hi, Deborah. Um, thank you very much for that presentation. Really good um, uh, explanation of, of a very succinct presentation, actually. Um, really appreciated sort of some of the uh, Transitions you painted around, you know, from, from farmer fields to value chains to landscapes, and also the um, the example of the green growth, for example, in Colombia, Tanzania. I think what what I'd like to ask is around the investing in landscapes um, issue that you raised, and I guess what I'm trying to get at is that the the base unit of a donor is. Um, is a development project, often a, a grant and increasingly uh, innovative financing instruments like repayable contributions or even loans. And so as we, uh, as you encourage us to think from 
more projects to much more complex uh, uh, landscapes, how do we um, tool ourselves to, to, to invest at such a level? Um, uh, there, there's obviously a predominant focus right now with the growth agenda to invest in very distinct value chain projects. Um, the challenge with that, like you mentioned earlier, is, is we, we are changing the landscapes by going in uh, very heavily on, on one type of uh, value chain, whether it be just pushing all on irrigation or palm oil or soybean. Um, and so what are the, 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 the new tools and data sets that you referred to in one of your last slides that could help donors um, sharpen their, their financial tool set, if you the toolbox, if you wish? Yeah, that's a that's a very good question. So the the um, the new tools really is that we have a lot better spatial information. We have layers considering, you know, that we can do detailed uh, soil quality mapping now. We can do detailed landscape assessments now. We can do detailed um, ecosystem services mapping. We can create uh, evidence base for where to where you can develop the most effectively with the most projects. Even if you're dealing with a single crop, if you're looking at that landscape, there's places where you can get better production easier with less damage to the environment than you can in another place. And you need to know, or the local people need to know how much investment here, how much investment there. The Colombian Llanos was a very interesting case for this because, because it has a very poor soil. The reason it was so expensive uh, is that there's very low uh, basic primary productivity because the soil is very, very poor. So the issue is, okay, how do you build up that soil to actually create the context for higher productivity without then having off-site damages or, so that you can reduce the amount of area where you're growing uh, the crops? And that's the kind of thing that the new tools and, and evidence can come in underneath and help people understand, as well as I think putting into these larger contexts of the ecosystem services, understanding the on and off site, the trade offs amongst the different um, values that you're taking up. And I think it's something that, that investors can actually look for. They can look for go to maps. They can look for, you know, what are our spatial options for reducing um, the impact of these developments, uh, that type of thing. Hi, uh, Nikita here. Just just a quick follow up, Deborah, to your, your previous question. So now that we have all these new tools and it's more on the, the spatial tools, like you mentioned, uh, do you have any experiences of, uh, or can you tell us who is using those tools? Is it really more um, government authorities, whether it's district, provincial, or national ministries, or uh, or do you have experiences of donors actually using them? Or do you have any uh, experience of private entities? I'm thinking of some of the national banks um, and, and perhaps local financial institutions using this to, to guide their investments and loans. Can you give us an idea of where these tools are being used and whether it's just very nascent and um, perhaps who should be using them? How, how do I, I, I also, my experience is that they're not very well used uh, at the, at the moment, the ecosystem services tools, the landscape scale are not very well used and could be used an awful lot more. I don't see them being used for investments, which I think is a major mistake. I mean, these tools can also map carbon for you and do all kinds of things, depending on what the goals are of your investment and what your financing is. Um, and they're, they are being used um, for, I think, gov more, much more government level sort of monitoring, say, forest cover, things like that. And what we're, where we're trying to bring them is into these larger public-private partnerships and demonstrate what can really be done here. And these, these are quite strong tools in a way. And you mentioned already that there was even a, a new ministry installed in a way. Do you think that the, the sort of the political economy can be changed with, with tools like this? Do you sense something like that happening, the right situation? Do approaches change uh, because of that? Well, it was very interesting talking to um, the people at the Ministry of Environment in Ethiopia. Uh, you know, Ethiopia is sort of a, the classic case of, of land degradation and also decades of investment in sustainable land management. Um, and uh, so they're not, 
they're not immune to this, I mean, not unaware of, of the issues that they have in terms of, of sort of landscape management. But what they were asking me for was what they wanted to do was institute more landscape scale pilots to demonstrate, for example, ecosystem-based approaches that were more integrated. And in what's, there, what's happening now, too, is that, for example, the, the GIZ Sustainable Land Management Program, which is absolutely successful and huge and being rolled out through multi-donor partnership now throughout Ethiopia, there's also a program to add uh, climate-smart agricultural investments on top of it. So they're realizing that they're, these are already even sort of different sectors and they're bringing them together. And now everyone we're talking to in Ethiopia is talking about having to bring all of the different uh, thinking together uh, and integrate it and also sectors for the green growth strategy. The green growth strategy is agriculture, forestry, uh, energy and transport. So they're, they're, they already have an agenda where they need to integrate these things and roll it out through the country. But um, and they're investing in tools. The, Ethiopia is also the test, uh, the success case for soil mapping, for example. They put a huge effort into mapping their own soils, much above and beyond any other country in Africa so far. So, so these agendas are, are, are emerging. And I think that that's a fantastic thing because you really do need the demand to come in part from, from the questions and the, the, the needs of the governments and the investors. USAID is also another interesting example. You know, they, they, they invest an awful lot of money in basically sort of food security programs, disaster relief and development type of programs, huge sums. And they've recently changed, I think it was just last year, a year and a half ago, they've insisted that um, a certain amount of the money in any of these very large programs that used to just roll out to, to produce food actually include a research component, understanding that they needed support for measuring and monitoring uh, and understanding the results they're getting so they can target and do better. And so that's also another example of a, of a donor actually taking up this idea uh, and trying to get it into their program. Yeah. Is it possible to ask you if any of the people listening have, have thoughts or experiences in trying to engage with this landscape scale within their own investments or programs that they'd like to, to share? Um, just sharing experiences in understanding the landscape approach. It takes a lot of uh, coordination and working with all of the different sectors and all of the different variables or factors. And this is a, a, a problem or an issue to see in small island developing states, even though we're so small in order to organize things and get a sector on every stakeholder in a sector on one page, it does take some uh, heavy, heavy-handed organization. So basically, there are implementation problems, particularly in the Caribbean. I don't know if there's any advice you would advise, seeing as some of your examples came from developing countries. I, I, I think that, that that's um, a real issue that needs to to be addressed. Within these examples that I have presented, they also were involving sort of long-term engagement, which first could be started through you know, external in intervention and you hope would be maintained. Um, the the in integrated landscape initiatives that are being reviewed by the, um, the Landscape for People, Food and Nature initiative has, has documented hundreds of these. And one of the key messages is that it takes it does take time and it takes enabling investments to get this to work. So the question I suppose would be what's the, um, you know, what's the benefit of that and is the benefit enough uh, to, to make it worth the investment uh, in time? Um, and that's, that's obviously a, you know, a contextual issue. In some cases maybe it is and in some cases people may get tired. But I think if it, it the big concern, of course, is really, you know, global sustainability, isn't it? The sustainability of our food systems. And um, so I, I think we have a, a even though it's, it takes a lot of time and engagement, because it does, it takes a lot of, of negotiation. The projects we've worked in with the, the PES schemes, for example, you're talking about years of basically people getting together and discussing and negotiating uh, mm -hmm. before you come to a workable scheme. So there's no getting around that, I don't think. 